Good morning, everyone. Ah, oh, hi. It's nice to see you. Let us now prepare to come into the presence of God, taking a moment of silence so that we may make our own individual confessions. <clears throat> we who confess silently or aloud, we are heard by God. Anyone who stands with Christ and is born again is a new creation. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Amen. I know that with it being 9 11, a time so many people mourn or do choose some time for quiet contemplation, there's probably a lot on everyone's mind today. I wanted to begin by asking if there are prayer requests. Anyone come with requests today? My eyes are bothering me. Okay. A little excitement. The British are coming. I know. <clears throat> Where's Paul Revere when we need him? See, no turned, warning at all. I turned my phone off because it has a Monty Python ring on it. So. Glad you mentioned that. I got the, <laughs> the fire tones for Air, uh, Engine 51. That'll wake you up. Well, I did think of one public prayer request this week as I talked uh, to so many women and was reading kind of what people were saying. And I just pray for uh, those who exercise and uh, fear for their safety, um, for the family and friends of um, Eliza who died in Memphis. Um, it's just such a tragic story, it really is. And um, for those of you that are not aware, this is a young woman, a mother, uh, 34 years old, I believe, yeah. who uh, was kidnapped during her very early morning run. She was in the dark at the time, they think. Um, and they seem to have caught the man. He was very sloppy. It wasn't that hard to trace him. Um, but come to find out, he had previously uh, been in prison for uh, another kidnapping. And that woman escaped. And he was actually released early. <clears throat> and I think that um, it does, for many women, raise the question of what a woman's life is worth anymore to us that um that he would be on the street after yeah, it's too bad he wasn't work. in for a drug charge he would have probably still been in there yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. but um <laughs> anyway violent crime as you might uh know her uh, situation ended with her kidnapping and then her murder um, and it all happened within seven miles from the time she was taken until they eventually found her body um, and, you know, maybe it's just because I have a daughter, but um, I do think that this particular case with this woman in Memphis has really hit a lot of women very hard and um, is very shocking to many of us for different reasons. So I just pray for people that are thinking about that um, and really looking at our nation and where we're going uh, with violent crime, with respect for each other our criminal system. I, I think that there really are quite a list of things we can be praying for around that. But I wanted to bring that this morning. It's really been on my heart. Yes, please. Yes, uh, we have a, a young high school friend who's really been struggling with a lot. So we will pray for uh, Yanni 
and um, I thank you for reminding me. Um, a, another high school student that you may have heard about the, uh, because she died locally, but a 16 year old um, had committed suicide right before school began. Female hockey player, uh, extremely successful, beautiful young girl. Very hard for many of us to understand why she committed suicide. Um, and our community, I think, was affected by that because she knows a lot of people in Tampa, was on the hockey scene there. But also because at Catherine School, we had a boy who committed suicide right before school ended. So this is the second 16-year-old in less than six months who's chosen suicide. Um, so again, we have people in our community who are really hurting uh, with things that seem very out of our control. But I just remind each one of us, nothing is out of control for God. God can take any of this and make something good out of it. Uh, my hope is that we will be more invested in teenagers and young adults realizing that if two successful 16-year-olds can kill themselves, most teenagers are vulnerable, clearly. Um, and, you know, these, these were kids that were very well-loved and had very large communities of friends and family. So it is really a struggle to even understand. Um, but, you know, it's good for all of us to remember to reach out to each other, to care about each other, Years ago, when I worked in hospice, they taught me that the highest rate proportionally of suicide was actually very elderly men, believe it or not. They were finding that the men, let's say like late 80s and early 90s, that they would just give up. In many cases, their spouse had died ahead of them and they were profoundly lonely and uh, their suicides might be what we would think of as like a passive suicide, mm -hmm. but they would effectively kill themselves. And they, at that time, were the highest rate of suicide in the country, which I was so shocked by. I never forgot that. Um, and even though that's uh, probably more than five years ago now that uh, I was taught that, you know, I, I've really used it in my own work to be much more mindful when I see uh, elderly men come through the hospital alone, perhaps not have enough of a community, um, I am much more aware of that now. Um, and, you know, these groups may seem like they're in pockets, but if you start counting up all the pockets, you realize that the community of people who could be hurting is actually very large. And as Christians, we are sworn to include those who feel they are not included. So I encourage you this week to reach out to people. Um, it seems like there's a lot that we could do to show love. Thank you for that. Is there anything else that you want to add? Certainly our prayers for Ukraine continue. Um, there was some good news on that front I heard this week. So uh, hopefully they are truly pushing Russia back a little bit and making some progress toward peace. That was suggested in the press this week. So I really hope that that's accurate. That would be so wonderful to have this wrap up and end in peace. Is there anything else? Let's pray. Lord, I feel like I've already said the prayer. You hear what's on our hearts. You hear what we leave unsaid. Today, I'd ask you to pray for eyes that see and don't bother us, for love that we share, not just keep to ourselves, for people who know you are there, have been taught you are there, and are able to turn to you in times good and difficult. Lord, I pray you give us the strength to be better Christians in the way we show love and in the confidence that we need to reach out to those who are lost or alone in love. 
Lord, I ask you to continue to be with the people of Ukraine and all those throughout the world that may be suffering or may need your relief from war, from hunger, from fighting, from unwanted solitude, from pain of any kind. And I pray that we always remember in our hours of need the prayer that you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The scripture for today is from Isaiah chapter 40, <clears throat> verses 28 to 31. And Isaiah is a little bit interesting because these verses are much longer than elsewhere in scripture. But I assure you, it's only three verses technically. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint. And to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. The word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Twenty-one years ago, at around this time, many of us were very likely watching a television screen somewhere. All around the country, it really seemed like people who had been at work or at school were suddenly getting notifications from loved ones. Is your TV on? Have you heard what's on the radio? Do you know what's happening in the country right now? Only as we watched did it slowly begin to sink in for most of us that we were under some sort of attack. At first, we thought this was just an accident. I even remember the initial press saying a plane has crashed into a building in New York. It was presented very passively. No one would ever do that on purpose. It was inconceivable. Of course, after plane and then another plane hit, we realized with a sense of horror that there was a lot more to this. Of the 2,977 people who died that day around the events of 9-11, 14%, or 415, were specifically emergency workers in New York City. I even know people that were there, and I still can't conceive for that community of the level of impact that had to have been for them. The lives of those in active duty or reserve military status were also immediately changed. Most were sent into some form of active duty, called up if they weren't already on active duty. Many found themselves part of an invasion or service overseas. And many of them came home from that 
changed. Difficult memories were rekindled for many veterans. We had been in peacetime for so long up until then. People like me didn't even have an experience truly of the nation in a major conflict. We might have been born with Vietnam unresolved, but we were so small, we didn't even have a memory of the country in a large scale conflict. And not everyone we left <clears throat> had really dealt with the aftermath of prior service. We didn't really talk about post traumatic stress back then. 9 11 became known as triggering, we might say today, for so many. And this morning, not only in a sort of memorial, but also in a bit of a positive way. I just salute each of you that called to service that day in some way. For me, it was a literal come to Jesus moment. At that exact time, I had been working in work that I would call more secular. It was still certainly holy work, but I wasn't preaching and I wasn't regularly serving a hospital. I had been, but I really was almost like taking a break is how I look back on it. My schooling had taken eight and a half years. And from almost the point of graduation, I mean, there was very little time in between. I had accepted a position in a lockdown psychiatric ward where everyone was either requiring a locked psych unit or locked for withdrawal from various addictions. So a pretty tough patient population. And I was pretty exhausted. And I thought somehow that I had a reason to be exhausted. But I realized that I had gone so far over to secular work after doing all of that, that I was acting like I was resting from God. And that was certainly not intentional. So 9-11 happened and it put me into really a deeply spiritual time for me. And one of the things I said to God was, I won't ever do this again. For the rest of my life, I will always do your work. And for 21 years now, I have. And I've never, ever regretted it for even a second. I think that good things can come from horrible things things we experience in our own personal lives individually, things we experience as a nation. Those moments that God forces us to be reflective can be those moments that God is really having a conversation with us. They are times to stop and really pay attention to what God is trying to say. This morning, I believe we are really truly gathered in this space, in this moment, because of the service of every member of our military, past and present, and because of the sacrifices of our first responders after 9-11. We're free and we're safe to worship as we wish this morning because of what other people have done for us because of a strong nation that did not lay down and give up on 9-11, but came together. As I was working on this, I thought, we don't really spend enough time being grateful. Our country has withstood some terrible things over its history. 
And we're really young as a nation to have gone through as much as we've gone through. And I understand the urge, the desire to just move on sometimes. I get it. But even if we're not dwelling in our challenges and our struggle, I just feel so grateful. When I worry about where we are going in individual moments, I remember where we have been. I reflect on our somewhat unlikely success. George Washington referred to us as a great experiment. A nation as young as ours, and yet still we are, in fact, one of the strongest in the world. It's amazing, really. The words today that I read from our passage in Isaiah are so timely. To just slightly rephrase them, to magnify them, I repeat part of it. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is as the only one, the everlasting God. A God who is with us yesterday, today, and forever. May we be grateful and full of thankfulness. Our Lord is the creator of the earth and all that is beyond. Our Lord does not faint or grow weary ever. May we be inspired always to carry on. Our Lord is understanding. The understanding of the Lord is so big it is unsearchable. It is above reproach and without doubt or question. Our God understands when we do not. Our Lord, the one God, gives power to the faint. If you should ever find yourself in your own personal valley, perhaps even in the shadow of death, remember that. To the person who has no might, our God increases strength. I've seen this one many times. I've been sent to visit people, grown adults, who weighed no more than 70 pounds in the hospital. And let me tell you, the spirit shines through. Some of the strongest, mightiest people have been those 70 year old, those 70 pound year olds. They're so small in stature and yet so mighty in spirit and in faith. Why, as verse 30 says, even the young faint and grow weary. Young men and women may fall in exhaustion. But it is those who wait for the Lord who renew their strength. They are the ones who mount up with wings like eagles. They are the ones who run and are not weary. They are the ones who walk and are not faint. It's easy when times are long and hard, when we struggle or we feel weak, to grow cynical. We see the evidence of that everywhere. Perhaps even we ourselves come at times to doubt God. But remember God's own words. Those times are the testing of our faith. They are not wrong. They are proof that we are Christians who have struggled like all in the Bible. I really believe that these times are allowed by God. And don't lose the wording there because I don't believe God wills these things for us. I think God allows them. Much of our struggle, let's be honest, it's part of the human condition. Some of it, we do it to ourselves. 
But I believe God allows it because this God who wants the best for us also wants to test us. The Bible says that by testing our faith, we may grow even stronger so that we might have the faith we had as children throughout our lives. I heard a great story this week, and as I looked, it seemed to be going viral, so it'll probably be all over the place, at least by the end of today. Princess Catherine of Wales was talking to some of the mourners who had graduated been gathering outside and she turned as she often does to talking about her children and she said that when her youngest child the little prince louis who was only just at preschool this year was told of the death of queen elizabeth ii this week he said at least granny is with great grandpa now even such a small child, barely four, he can have such a powerful and far-reaching faith that it stops us in our tracks. And sometimes that faith of a child is so natural and so matter-of-fact, it actually inspires us to think about our own first responses to things. We get caught in the tragedy of death, the tragedy of destruction, and we forget the biblical understanding. Behold, I make all things new. The death has to happen because that's how we get the resurrection. The queen has gone to a much better place than we can even fathom. And someday it is promised to us, too. An interesting thing that a friend of mine taught me is really such a fact. She was talking about the death of the Queen of England, and she said, because she died at Balmoral, she died a Presbyterian. And I said, wait, how does this work? Explain this. And she talked about how the Church of Scotland will oversee the very first service of worship, the first state funeral in the Queen's honor. She was not acting as the Anglican head of the Church of England at the time of her death. She was out of the country in the understanding of the historic documents between the two state churches, and that's important. You know, Americans can't even conceive of this. We don't have this system. But when you have state churches, they take over this type of death of a king or a queen. The Church of Scotland, of course, is our mother church. It's Presbyterian. It's probably kind of odd to think about all this, but I've personally lived in the United Kingdom twice. I've spent time in Scotland. As you might guess, an enormous percentage of my own family is either from Scotland or England. In fact, my father's family will be celebrating their 400th anniversary in this country in just a few years. We've been here forever, that's the truth of it. And I don't wash over the parts of that that some may find negative, not at all. I don't think pride in your history has to be an either or. I realize that my family was on both sides in the Civil War, that my family was very active in the Revolutionary War and that they broke with their own heritage because they had come from England. That's why they were here in time for the revolution. I like to think that we made choices to the best of our ability. I find it impossible not to admire the queen. And I think I have probably heard every possible criticism of her. But I keep coming back to really basic things. How many people in the history of the world can we say 
did their job as well as possible for 70 years. How many people can you say that about? The truth to me is that she was extraordinary. Balmoral was always a very special place to her as it had been for a long time before she came along. And she always said that it was her favorite place. I think she did choose it as her place of death. I don't think it was an accident. And her coffin will first lie in rest in Edinburgh at the National Scottish Cathedral there. As a part of assuming the title king, her son Charles vowed to uphold the Presbyterian system of church governance in Scotland. And you might be interested to know that this was established in 1707. The act of union between England and Scotland established this duty and the role of the British monarch to quote, preserve the settlement of the true Protestant religion as established by the laws made in Scotland. In short, they didn't want any more Reformation drama. There had been so much fighting and death over who was going to be in charge and whether the countries were going to have Catholicism, Anglicanism, or some other form of Protestantism that in 1707, they came to an agreement that they wrote down that established it forevermore. And it pretty much ended the bloodshed and conflict that had pre-existed. Elizabeth Alexandra Mary Windsor wasn't even supposed to be queen. When you look back at the line of succession, she was always supposed to be royal. She wasn't supposed to be queen. And yet when she heard that news while traveling in Africa with her husband, fate had brought her to it. And as she said herself, by God's grace, God brought her through it. People undercut that a lot. And I, I really think it's because of the secular leaning world that so many people live in today. But one of the reasons that I always respected her was because her faith was extremely important to her. She invoked God like many people smile. And I just have such admiration for that. It's not that common, especially, I might add, where there are state religions. They tend to have less religiosity in those countries. There are lessons beginning in scripture but extending through so many models of leadership for our times. God, of course, must be our first God and our one God. And it's easy to be pulled away as we accept the faiths of others to kind of lose track of ourselves. But as Christians, <clears throat> Jesus is our model. And Jesus is our model first for what a leader looks like. We can ask aloud and scripture will answer what is required of us. Moreover, our text today reminds us that God gives to us generously and stands with us, helping us to become all that we are meant to be. One of the single most comforting things I try to always fit in there with my patients who are struggling or suffering, and that's a lot of people, unfortunately. I always remind them that they are never alone. God is with us and stands closer to us when we suffer. Scripture makes that clear. Job was never alone. As God looked after Jacob and Joseph and Paul and so many others, God is also now looking to us to be the leadership for Christians today. And that can seem very daunting at times. 
but in a world crying out for love and acceptance as modeled by Christ. We are the ambassadors now. Let us claim in love this opportunity, our royal legacy of the one king, if you will, with grateful hearts. Amen. So I've only been given one announcement today. And if we have others, please just let us know. The announcement is that if you would like to participate in the Romans 10-9 Bible Memorization event for September 18th, it is going to be held after the regular service in the sanctuary. So you can start your memorizing if you'd like to be part of that. Is there anything else anyone wants to announce? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.